Hey sellers, Rob here, finally getting around to doing Artillery 201. Uh, this one's a remake of the previous one because I've made a couple of mistakes, so I'm going to be doing it again. And uh, apologies for the delay, but things are what they are. Uh, this one's going to cover things like adjusting, converting artillery, as well as uh, some effects. And we're going to be talking a lot about pre-register and how that all fits in. And hopefully the copious examples will give you a better idea of how to use OBA in your game. So let's get to it. Right before we talk about uh, pre-registered flyer, let's just look at what we have here on the board. So we have German defenders in, in uh, the edge of a small village up here in a uh, steeple. Second story steeple, we have a German A1 with a radio. And he'll be firing 80 millimeter battalion mortar OBA. We've got four six sevens in various defensive positions and buildings, and we also have one tank sitting in orchard right now that just took out a Russian tank, causing it to flame, and it ended up uh, dispersing smoke. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to start with the uh, Russian turn. And the Russians, for their part, have several four or sevens forward, and amongst the trees, they managed to maneuver a gun into position, ready to fire on that. They also have another tank. And of course, they have a truck to lug around their 57 double long. Uh, the Germans, or excuse me, the Russians also have their own 7-0. He's going to be set up here with his own radio. And we're going to make this the uh, spring of 44, so grain and orchards and all that will be in effect. Now, uh, again, the Russian radio, like I pointed out in my basic video, you can see it has three values, a 6, 7, and an 8. And that's dependent upon the year that it can be used in. So if you look at the back, for us, anything post July 43 um, will be a eight for contact, uh, excuse me, uh, including July. So we're gonna have an eight for radio contact for him. So we're gonna start off with the uh, Russian turn. I should also mention the uh, defending Germans do have an FFP, uh, sorry, an A um, pre-registered hex located in 04. Unfortunately, wasn't able to use it at that time, so we're, hopefully we can sweep that in now. Let's talk about pre-registered fire then before we continue. So, pre-registered fire is only allowed by SSR. Again, read your scenarios. It gives you that kind of information. You also have the option in some historical campaigns, as well as design your own, to purchase this. And you must define the hex you're going to use before any setup is done. So you never know which uh, where the enemy is going to be, which again is why I picked this obvious crossroads. Unfortunately, like I said, I just wasn't able to bring it down. It gives you an extra black chip to your draw pile. So for the Germans, we're going to have an extra black chip, which means we have nine black, three red. And you may dispense with a spotting round and directly place an FFE1. Now, any extent of error, should you roll a five or six for accuracy, is always going to be halved, and that is rounded up. So the most you're ever going to be will be three hexes off for a spotting round or the FFE. You can use the pre reg for any type of fire mission, including Creeping Barrage, but Creeping Barrage has some uh, alternate rules that you have to use as well, which we're going to cover when we get to that type of fire mission. Pre-registered fire is limited to the OBA and the radio that start the scenario with that capability, so you cannot switch radios or, or uh, batteries. Uh, for example, another battery cannot use this other OBA battery's pre-registered X. It must have its own if it was so specified. Regarding ammunition plentifulness, uh, if you have plentiful ammo, you get a black chip added to your draw pile. However, should you have scarce ammunition, you get a red added to your draw pile. So let's, again, we'll go through a complete fire mission from both sides. Uh, remember the advanced sequence of play order. We have ordnance smoke, and then that's followed by OBA. So all your onboard guns, mortars, what have you, that want to fire smoke must do so before you do OBA. Once OBA is done, then the rest of your firing can be done. Basically, the minute one of your guns fires something besides smoke, you can no longer fire smoke. <clears throat> so just remember that. It always starts with radio contact. So our Russian needs to roll an 8 or less. All right, we rolled a 7. So uh, he's got contact. And now we must do battery access. Again, Russians are five and two according to the nationality capabilities chart. So they have five black and two red to uh, start off the mission with. So hopefully with those kind of odds, it's very likely they might draw red. 
but I draw black instead. So we have contact and we have access for the Russian. Now the next thing we have to do is put down an AR where we want to call fire. For us, we want to call down a spotting round on this location. Reason why is because of all the smoke, um, I cannot be accurate. And because these units themselves are uh, concealed, it's going to necessitate a second chit drop. But I figure my best option would be there. I could aim for the tank. The tank is known, or better yet, I could put it on these units here because the tank is a known enemy unit, and therefore I don't have to make that second chit drop. But again, I also have to worry about how much smoke uh, hinders my line of sight. Now, when it comes to accuracy, um, again, pre-register to side, it's based on nationality. If you're German, British, or US, you can get away with a one or a two, and all of the nationalities must roll a one for accuracy. So in this case, it actually does not matter which hex I put it in, I'm not gonna be accurate. So I'm going to put a spotting round uh, here in a U5. Now we confirm LOS because it's just straight across, quite easy. Again, I will be paying a plus two for my accuracy, which means it cannot be accurate. If I pick the location that was, um, say for example, this location, my original thought, because these two units are considered unknown to the observer, then it would necessitate a second temporary chit draw in order to confirm access. Reminder that should a concealed unit be in non-concealment terrain, that it's considered known to an observer. They have better optics, better better binoculars. They're able to see that kind of stuff. It doesn't lose your concealment, but you're, you are considered known to the observer. So for those reasons, we're going to be putting our AR request here because we can depend upon that to uh, negate that second jig draw. <clears throat> right, now we have to roll for accuracy. Again, because it's not pre-registered, the Russian cannot be accurate, so there's no point rolling. Now we do a direct random location die roll. Again, this does not half in any fashion. Black would be the distance. All right, we go two for two. Not too bad, I guess. So our spotting round, because we must lay a spotting round first, will land in this location here. Now, um... You don't worry about line of sight now, whether or not he can see it. That's not conducted until the next fire phase. So for now, our 7-0 is marked as uh, having fired with a prep fire counter. Remember also that calling an OVA or spotting is not a concealment loss activity, so he's perfectly entitled to keep his uh, concealment. Now assume that in the uh, intervening uh, Prep fire phase, nothing else has happened. The gun is just getting into position, so it's not in a position to actually fire. We're going to go to the defensive fire phase, and then we're going to let the Germans do their business as well. So for us, we need an aid as well. All right, rolled a seven, so that's quite good enough for contact. Now I must do my chit drop. Remember that I have nine black and three red to choose and we get a black so we have contact and we have access again if i had red then it would be uh, end of action and loss of access to the battery now because we have a pre-registered hex in this location i can choose to drop an ffv directly on it and then uh, I can choose to um, convert it to an FFE2 after correcting it in the next fire phase, which is what I'm going to do. So we start off with our AR. We're going to drop it on a pre-registered hex, which means I need to roll a 4 or less. So I can disregard any kind of smoke obstacles that may come into place. So roll a 3. So we have a, a target round. So I'm going to go right to an FFE1 and resolve it. Now, 80 millimeter is too small to crater, so all we have to worry about is flame. Let's make the conditions dry, EC or dry, so there's a very possibility it might flame these two. And, uh, of course, we've got the truck. So I always tend to work in a clockwise fashion, so my first target's going to be the woods. If I get a KIA result, there's a possible flame. Let's bring up the IFT. 
So in this case, a four on the 16 is, or excuse me, a uh, six on the 16 is going to be a two check. So there's not going to be any chance of flame. I need a KIA result to have that. So then we go to the truck. So this is an unnumbered vehicle. Unnumbered vehicles are uh, shot against the vehicle line of the IFT. So you can see if you cross-reference the star vehicle line with the caliber of the gun, I need a base 9 to hit. So if I roll a 9, the truck is immobilized. And if I roll an 8 or less, it is destroyed. If I roll 4 or less, then it will be a flaming wreck. So roll a 9. So the truck is immobilized. All right, again, I can ignore this hex because I cannot open it, uh, excuse me, uh, affect it. However, if I know my opponent has a field phone, I may want to roll for those hexes anyways on the off chance that I cut his security line if it happens to run through those hexes. Uh, but for us, we know that the Russian has a field phone, so we don't have to worry about that. Plus, they're on the attack. So I have to roll for flame, possibly, and N4. All right, I rolled a 7 again, so that's not going to be any result. So fairly ineffective. I only managed to immobilize the truck. So we replace the FFV1 with an FFV2. And then we mark our fire as having fired. And it's end of uh, phase for him. <clears throat> so the rest of the Russian turn goes on. Again, just for the sake of this, we're not going to do any actions besides OVA. And we're now into the German turn. So first things first is we must roll a wind change. No wind change. So now we can do uh, our prep fire phase. So we're going to do the same thing here. We have a um, FFE2 and we want to correct it. So let's look at our options. So the first thing is provided we have LOS, which we do because we're on a level two steeple, we can see over the buildings and we might clip the smoke, but that's only a plus two. So we do have sight to the LOS. And even if we didn't have sight to the base, we do have it to the uh, top of the blast height. So we have to roll for radio contact. Again, because we're using battalion mortar, I can get away with a minus two. So I rolled a one net, and uh, therefore we do have contact. Get rid of these. And if I have access, contact, and LOS to the spotting round or the FFE, then I can do one of those following four. So let's look at those first. We can leave the FFE in place and convert it, or we can correct it up to three hexes, which is what we're going to do. If this had been a spotting round instead, say for some reason it was very inaccurate and it landed three hexes off, we could correct that spotting round up to 18 hexes. We could also correct that spotting round up to 18 hexes and then convert it to an FFE1. That third bullet there is if we have LOS to the base level of the spotting round hex, which again we do, or the blast height, and a known enemy unit, you could convert a spotting round to an FFE. Again, if you have an unknown unit, you must do a chit draw. Uh, battery access chit draw and then the last thing that we can do is disregarding any smoke if we have LOS to the base level and a known enemy unit in or adjacent we can leave it in place and resolve it so what we're going to do is we're going to correct the FFE2 so some other options now if you're for some reason um, uh, FFE or you're spotting around lands in such a fashion that you can't see it Say, for example, it's in, uh, this is not a level two, he's on a level one steeple and would be blocked by buildings. He would not be able to see it. Uh, you have options. You must correct it or cancel it, and it can never be accurate. So if you want to correct your inaccurate, unseen blast uh, FFE, you must once again place an AR down. You attempt your correction, which cannot be accurate, so you actually don't roll, and you do an auto, a, a full... Uh, random location die roll. So again, our FFE2, we want to land it here. So we rolled our dice and we're going to go two, uh, five for two. So our FFE would actually fling off this way. One, two, three, four, five. That's how you would use that C1.335. Or you could just cancel it in place, start with an AR and then do it all again. You 
You may also, again, if we have a spotting round and it's errant, you can always cancel it, place a fresh AR, and then uh, followed by a spotting round as well. Just like you're starting off a mission. So you can uh, remove this. You put your AR down where you want to put it. You call in for fire, depending on your accuracy. For Russians, it's a three, so or excuse me, for Germans, it's a two, so it would not be accurate. And then we roll again a full random location die roll, six for six, way off the board in that direction. And then lastly, if you have an FFE2, for whatever reason you want to, uh, you may voluntarily cancel your FFE, which will then uh, get rid of your battery access and you have to attempt battery access once more. That's basically the uh, um, seven options that are available to you, four of them if you have line of sight, and three if you don't or if you want to voluntarily cancel. So again, for us, we have contact, we have access, and we have an FFE2. We're going to be using that first sub-bullet. We're going to um, correct the FFE a maximum of three hexes. So again, we place our or AR down where you want it. Now, if I choose my pre registered hex, obviously I wouldn't have to pay for any line of sight hindrances. However, if I drop it on here onto this gun, um, this way I can avoid any smoke penalties and I still have a chance of being accurate. So we want to bring our FFE there. We moved it a total of two hexes. So, first thing is we say we do accuracy 01. So we have a target around. and we now resolve it. All right, so 80 millimeter in the trees. Now we have an airburst potential. However, because it's an AT gun and it has a gun shield, normally it would offer a plus two. However, it versus indirect fire is reduced to a plus one, which would cancel out the minus one for an airburst. So this is just going to be a straight up roll on the 16 column. So we have an 11, so that's not going to be any effect. 11 on the 16 gives us a pending task check. Hoping for better. Uh, and they make it because they're a crew. So um, very ineffective target round. Now we go up to here. Now these guys will not be protected by anything, so they're going to be a minus one airburst. So rolled a modified 7 on the 16 is going to give us a 2 morale check. So the first one probably ELR'd and broken, and the second one, it will be broken. Again, we have 80 millimeter, which has a chance of flaming the grain. So we need to get a KA result, which we don't, so no effect there. We cannot impact our four because our caliber is not high enough, but we do have a tank. Now, when it comes to tanks, we're going to get into this with the effects, but basically, you can see the table on the screen there. Um, that's the only modifiers that you would use. So if all armor factors are below four, you get a minus one. If it's open top, a further minus one. And if all the armor factors are eight or higher, then it's a plus one. So our little tank here, our T40, is only uh, ones with an upper armor turret, but even so, that would only be a two. So it's going to be a minus one to this roll. Now, for AFV, unlike a truck, you roll directly on the column, and we need a K number plus one or a KIA to get a result. So in this case, we rolled, we rolled a critical. So uh, that's going to be automatic destruction. Now, if you look at table six or column 16, we note the K slash number is a three. If you roll less than that number, um, or excuse me, if you, the final die roll is less than or equal to half of that number, then it's a flaming wreck. So because we needed a three, um, a K3, we rolled a snake eyes. We subtract one for being all armor factors below four. We're actually at a one. And a one is less than equal to half of the three. So this is actually a flaming wreck. No chance of crew survival.
if it had been a three I rolled, then there would be chance of crew survival and it still would be destroyed. And now we must do our mobilized truck. Again, a seven is less than the nine that we need on the vehicle line. So this truck will be destroyed as well. And it has a crew survival rate of seven. So they are, or we do have a uh, Russian crew on the ground. All right, and they get placed under the vehicle. And then lastly, we have a wood hex. If we get a K result, we have possible flame creation. So here we are, again, we got K result. We got a 1KA. And if you look at the red colors on, or the symbols to the left of the 1KA, that indicates different effects. So we have the uh, cross there, original HE effects die roll causes possible flame creation. So we make a die roll plus the EC. Now we said the EC were dry. Dry EC would be a plus one uh, to the effects die roll. So the base condemning number for woods is nine, and we have a plus one because of the EC conditions. So if we roll an eight or more, then there will be a flame. So we rolled an eight, so we have a flame created in that location. All right, so once we've resolved the FFE to our satisfaction, we flip it over to the FFEC. All right, and that'll be end of the uh, German's fire, so he'll be marked with a prep fire counter. Again, any other German prep fire can go off, any movement can go off, and now it's going to be the Russian turn to defensive fire. So first thing is, is that should be a spotting round, not an AR. Um, yeah, apologies for that. Uh, so this should have been a spotting round, not the AR. Remember, our spotting round was two hexes off. So now we look at our spotter, we look at the round because these are one and a half level buildings and the blast height's only two. There's not enough uh, um, space for us to see that. So we do not have LOS to that spotting round. So because of that, we have to, uh, man uh, we must correct it or we could decide to cancel it. If we, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna attempt to correct it back onto our target. So again, we need our AR. All right, we make uh, our accuracy, which cannot be accurate. So we're just gonna roll random location and hope for a good roll. All right, so we roll direction five and one. So our spotting round will now land over here. AR comes off. And again, it's end of action for the Russian observer. So if we skip ahead to the Russian turn and uh, once more, again, these will come off. Russians have to roll for battery uh, contact. Now, because they already have access once, they get a minus one, so that nine is good enough. So they do have contact. We still have access, and so we can do something with that spotting round. Again, and now we have one of those four options. We can leave it in place, or we can correct it and convert it, or uh, decide to cancel if you wanted to. We could also convert it in place, and that way we don't have to worry about accuracy, because remember, because of all the smoke, even if I adjusted it one hex to get optimal placement, there's a chance that it may go wrong, and then, um, because it cannot be accurate because of all the smoke. So we're gonna use the uh, second option, uh, excuse me, the third option, and we're gonna convert in place. So we announce out loud, we convert our uh, F spotting round to an FFE, and we uh, carry it out. So we're gonna be using 100 millimeter for the Russians. Again, that is not big enough to cause cratering. So we only have to worry about the two occupied hexes. So first things first is we'll do the vehicle. Now again, because the uh, Panzer IV has a turret armor of uh, upper, a frontal super superstructure of eight, um, there will not be any modifiers to the die roll. So this is straight up on the 120. 
So we rolled a 7. Again, no modifiers apply. A 7 on the 20 gets us a 2 morale check. That is not a result that we can work with. Then I rolled a 3, or excuse me, a 5 instead. A 5 would have given us a 4 morale check. Now, because this is 1 greater than the kill number, this would be impacting the AFE. So we look at the die. We determine that it's going to be a turd hit because the black die is less than the white. And that automatically creates a shock. No possible automatic shock. If the colors had been reversed, then the uh, AFE would have become immobilized. Now we do the units here in the building. Now because they are on the ground floor of a one and a half story building, they will get a further plus one for the le uh, level above them when it comes to indirect fire. So it's going to be a total of plus four on the 20. I rolled a modified 11. 11 on the 20 gives us an NMC. So they lose the concealment and they would have to take a normal morale check which they fail. All right, and then that's all we can resolve. So we take away the FFE1 and we replace it with an FFE2. End of action. And we mark our fire with a, uh, a prep bar. All right, so now we go into the uh, German, and we have a continuation that we have to decide what to do with it. Now, when it comes to correcting, the first thing to remember is you can only correct a spotting round and an FFE2. You can never correct a continuation nor a um, FFE1. It's only spotting rounds or FFE2s that can be corrected. This concentra or, um, HE concentration would be continuing throughout the balance of the German turn after the defensive fire phase. But now that we're into the uh, German phase, they no longer suffer the effect. So if anybody had moved in the course of this FFEC prior to the German defensive fire phase, they would be uh, having to pay penalties. So for example, if our crew decides maybe want to jump into the woods for whatever reason, uh, he's actually DM, but he's not on open ground, so he wouldn't have to uh, run. I should have marked him. But he always has the option of retreating back. There's a building under the, the dice tower, which he could uh, potentially go to. We do have a flame, so he wouldn't be heading towards that. So if our, our crew wanted to leave, and he'd have to come this way, he would not be impacted. However, should he have entered this hex, he would have to be rolled for All right, so continuation. Again, it never can be corrected. You must attempt battery access after radio contact. So let's do radio contact first. So we have an 8. Remember, battalion mortar, you get a minus 2. So we could have rolled a 10 or less. But 8 is sufficient. So we do have uh, contact. We now must do a fresh battery access attempt. So we should be down to 8 black and uh, 3 red. So it's very likely we might draw a red ship. You know, the odds are starting to stack against us. <clears throat> and we pull out, and luckily for us, we get another block. So we have a continuation. Uh, it basically marks the location of your previous FFE. So you have three options from this, play, uh, from this point. Two if you have LOS, and one if you don't. So if we have LOS to it, which we do because, again, of our level 2 steeple, we could replace this FFEC with a spotting round and uh, correct it. Why you want to do that? Possibly because you want to move farther than three hexes away. Remember, an FFE2 can only be corrected a maximum of three hexes. Say we know that there's something around here we don't like, like there's probably a spotter. We want to move our blast radius to maybe uh, our, uh, our seven just because it's not in the smoke, so therefore better chance of being accurate but it's four hexes away, we would need to change it to a spotting round in order to do that. Or we could leave it in place and we can convert it to an FFE1 and resolve it again, guaranteeing results. 
But for us, we're going to attempt a um, correction. Now, if that other case is if you don't have LOS to the blastite, you must remove this FFEC. So in the course of your um, FFE2, say, for example, you corrected or uh, and it landed in such a fashion that it was not seen, maybe you lost battery access or contact along the way, for whatever reason you cannot see the blastite, you must remove your FFEC. But again, for us, we don't have to worry about that. We're going to change it to a spotting round, and we're going to adjust it for hexes. So we put our spotting round down, we put our AR down where we want it, and we now must make our accuracy dial. Now again, because I'm skirting the smoke, I don't have to pay for that. I can be accurate on a one or a two. So we are not accurate. Now I can roll for correction. So it's going to go direction three for one, which is not too bad. So our spotting round would land here. Now when it comes to error, extent of error, again, remember that um, the maximum extent of error is the distance of correction divided by three. So again, because we had uh, four hexes uh, divided by three is one point change, you then round up to two. The most we could be off would be two hexes. Now again, in the example in the rule book, they say that if you, in that particular example, if you roll a one for extent of error, then you move one hex. If it's a two to six, you move two, uh, two hexes. Now, I don't know why they did it that way. It should be, I would think, 50-50. One to three would be one hex. Four to six would be two hexes. But using the rule as written, we can uh, say that because we only rolled a one, we only went one hex. Again, to the maximum of um, two hexes. And again, end of action for our observer. All right, so now we're going to go to the uh, German turn. Again, we do our normal wind change. Uh, we would add extra smoke because of the flame. I forgot to add that. Remember, this goes down in the advancing fire phase for the turn it was created in. So now there's really a lot of smoke. Um, all right, so now we have the uh, German turn. And the first thing we got to do again is radio contact. We have a spotting round. We do have access, so we must maintain radio contact again with a minus two. So we do have radio contact and we can continue our mission. Now again, looking at our options for a spotting round. We have those four sub-choices because we have LOS to it. We could uh, pre-designate that we're going to correct it and convert it, which is what I'm going to do. Or we could um, leave it in place and convert it right there. Uh, because this unit is not known, however, I would have to do a second chit draw before I could convert it in place. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it. I'm going to correct it two hexes. And then, actually, no, I'm going to, I'm going to correct, uh, convert this in place. So I must do a second chip draw. So now we should be down to seven black and three red. Hopefully I get a black. And they draw a red chip. So that means the red goes back in the bag. Remember, it's only temporary. And the spotting round comes off because, again, we uh, drew a red chip. So remember that whenever you draw a red chip, in this case was for a temporary chip to see if I could continue my fire mission intent. I rolled a red, and because of that, I lose my spotting round, um, and that red chip does go back into the bag. And then we'll work with the uh, the Russians. So again, it's now the Russian defensive fire phase, so they must do radio contact with a minus one. And he gets radio contacts. So now he can adjust his FFE2 if he so chose, or he could keep it in place. Now because um, the the modifiers are starting to get a little crazy up here. Uh, we may want to adjust one hex because even if it deviates one hex, it's still going to hit something that's German, which is what we're going to do. So we place our AR down. We make our uh, we cannot make an accuracy die roll because 
the plus four for the condensed smoke now would eliminate any chance of accuracy. So it's always going to be inaccurate. However, because we moved one hex, remember the maximum extent of error is the distance of correction divided by three rounded up. So the most we can be off is one round, uh, excuse me, one hex. So I'm just gonna roll one die. It's a two and that's where our FFE landed. So the AR comes off, we put down our FFE and we resolve it. So again, a 100 millimeter cannot impact the uh, roads. However, we have a chance of rubbling buildings. So let's start with W4. If it's a KA result, we have a chance of rubbling. So we have a four. Gives us a K4, which is not good enough for rubble. So then we do W5. All right, that's not gonna have any effect. We cannot impact V5, so we're gonna go to U5. And we have a five. Now, once again, these units are protected further with a plus one for that first level. So they have a total of plus four, which would make that five and nine, which makes that a one round check. Which they pass. And then finally, the tank, which I failed to roll for. So let me do that now. I should have done that in the uh, uh, rally phase. So we're flipped over, now we're a 50-50. We don't know what's gonna happen with our tank. And it's going, to be it's going to be attacked again with a 120. So if I roll a five or less, again, we will have a result. No modifiers because uh, the armor is between four and eight. So I roll a five, perfect. Uh, so a five again on the 20 is a um, four morale check. Again, it's one greater the kill number, so once more, it will be an automatic shock. So we take our unknown counter again, and we uh, flip it over. So once more, denoting their shock status. So again, on the next rally phase, they would have to make a one or two to be okay. Three to four, they would be, um, uh, it would be flipped over again. So our actions for this FFE2 are done. So again, we flip it over, and we now have an FFEC. So let's discuss some of the effects. Again, most of this we've already covered, but just as a refresher. Any armored vehicle, any unarmored vehicle is attacked on the vehicle line of the IFT, as we saw. So again, for the uh, 80 millimeter mortar, it's on the 16 column. That means a nine or less. It would be a 10 or less if you fire on the 20 column, etc. However, armored vehicles are fired against on the IFT using their uh, chart to the right, not their inherent armor factors. That modifies the chart to the right, but you don't actually use those armor factors. Again, they are, if everything's below four, it's a minus one. If you're open top, it's a minus one. And if all your armor factors are greater than eight or more, then um, it's a plus one. Any KA result will always be destroyed. And if it's less than or equal to half of the final die roll that corresponds to a kill number, on that IFT column will result in a burning wreck. So again, it's a bit of a convoluted sentence, but in on the 20 column, we have a K4 result. So any final die roll must be a one or a two after any corrections. If I roll a one or a two after any corrections, then the vehicle itself would be a burning wreck. Now you cannot affect more vehicles than the highest KA number. So again, on the 20 column, that's four as well as on the 16, which means that if you have five or six vehicles for some unknown reason, um, two of them may not be affected unless random selection puts them into the pile. So the only way to exceed that number is random selection. When you roll a K number or one greater, then as we said, you get an automatic shock, not a possible, it's an automatic, so there's no task check required to, against your morale, you just, you're automatically shocked. And if it's a hull hit, then you become immobilized. Any vulnerable passenger riders or crew are still susceptible to morale checks and PTCs collaterally. So if you have, for example, that truck had a uh, uh, the gun mount or a towed and the crew in the back of the truck, the crew would have to take uh, its own vulnerable PRC uh, check, again, depending on how you roll, obviously. When it comes to friendly units caught in the blast area, they have the morale lowered by one unless you're heroic or berserk. So if you're one of those two conditions, it does not apply to you and your morale is lowered uh, only by one. 
It also applies to the observer. If you correctly um, correct your FFE so that you're in the blast radius, you're calling in a danger close, uh, your morale will not be lowered as well. And again, we're going to get more into this when we get to the missions, but there's also other personnel that may not be impacted by the lowered morale. These include things like climbing units, aerial units, etc. But again, once we get into the actual fire missions, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. OBAs never have versus concealed units, and you must be 70 millimeter or greater to create a plus one LOS hindrance for the blast. So for our 100 millimeter here, again, those seven hex radius, any fire trace through it in, into it or out of it is always going to be impacted by a maximum of plus one just for the HE. And it's only a plus one, it's not per hex. When it comes to creeping barrage, however, then your, um, small, your LOS hindrance goes up to plus two because they would periodically add in smoke rounds along with the HE as the bombardment advanced to protect the troops coming up behind it. All right, so let's talk about white phosphorus. Now, white phosphorus uh, generally uses the smoke rules, but because of the inherent chemical burning properties, there's also some effects versus uh, unarmored units. So let's change up the Russians. We replace them all with this American 80 and a radio, or excuse me, a field phone sitting inside a stone building. For some reason, he was able to get uh, up to this location. This is where his phone is. This is where he's set up. And we have German units that have moved into various locations, including an upper floor location. Now, unbeknownst to the uh, uh, Germans, uh, Hex U5 is actually his pre-registered location. So in the American prep fire phase, the first thing he must do is roll for radio contact. In this case, the field phone's 11 or less. So he rolled a 7, so he's good. So he does have contact. Now he does battery chit draw. And now Americans always have plentiful ammunition. Uh, it's factored into the chit draw bag. That's why they have 10 black and 3 red to choose from. So more than likely we're going to be drawing a black chit, which we do. So now we have access. <clears throat> now we have uh, contact. Now we have access. Now we place our AR down. And we're going to announce that we're going to convert in place to an FFEC. So we place our AR down. Now I don't have to make any secondary chit draws because we have an unknown, uh, a known tank. As well, the unit on the ground floor, for whatever reason, never gained concealment. And so it is uh, known to the observer as well. So we can dispense with any need for a second chit draw. All we do is make our accuracy die roll, which again must be four or less. All right, so let's look at white phosphorus now. Um, white phosphorus is usually dealt with under the smoke rules, however, because it has a chemical component which burns, uh, any unit that's going to be in this blast area is going to be affected. So what we've done is we've replaced the Russians with Americans. We have an 8-0 with a field phone sitting in the woods, and he has access to 100 millimeter OBA with a pre-registered hex in U5. So first thing that happens in the American prep fire phase is we must make our radio contact roll, which again is 11 or less. So we have contact. Then we must make a battery uh, access draw. So again, Americans always have plentiful ammunition. This is reflected already in their chip draw piles on the national capabilities chart where it says 10 black, three red. So we would just have to add one black for the pre-registered hex to make it 11 to three. And not surprisingly, we draw a black chip. So we have access and we have contact. So now we can place our AR. And we're going to plop right into our pre-registered hex. Because it's pre-registered, we do not have to worry about the grain, which will not would normally be an LOS impact. But in our case, we can ignore it. So we just need to make a four or less. All right, roll the four. So we do have a target round. Now I can replace this AR with our pre-designated FFE1 that we declared was going to be a white phosphorus mission. Now we resolve it. So the way white phosphorus is resolved is each unit stack in each location gets a uh, gets two die rolls basically. The first one is done by you the attacker to see if it's a critical hit and or produce any flame and the second one is for the your opponent to do his actual white phosphorus normal morale check. 
When it comes to flame production, this can only be done if VCs are dry or very dry. So in our example here, we're going to be June 44, and we'll make it dry. So there'll be a plus one for any kindling attempt. So we do the target hex first, and we're going to do the leader up on the first level. So he's not affected by a critical hit or flame, so he does his normal morale check. Now, when it comes to white phosphorus, first of all, all consuming is lost if you're an LOS to a known good order enemy unit because you're too busy dancing around avoiding cinders to uh, stay concealed. And you get to use your terrain as a negative modifier to your die roll. So he's into stone building, he gets a minus three. So he's quite good. And now we do the ground floor. So again, we roll to see if we get a critical. And we do not, and we do not get flame. Now, for the sake of argument, say I have rolled a critical. The way that it would work for this 467 is twofold. First of all, the terrain gets inverted, so it's now going to be a positive to the die roll, which means he would need a four or less to avoid breaking. Secondly, we have a real good chance of creating a flame in that location. So first thing is, is he does his plus three morale check. So he just barely gets it, so he's pinned. Now we have to roll for flame. So because a stone building is a kindling number of 9, however, EC drops that down to an 8. If it's an 8 or more, then there will be a flame in that location. So I rolled a 6, so there's no flame. Now we go to the next hex. Again, I work in a clockwise fashion. Now, armor will not be impacted by white phosphorus. Uh, unarmored vehicles, yes, but uh, AFVs, no. However, should he be crew exposed, then there's a chance he could, well, he would have to take his morale check as well, again, with a plus two for being crew exposed modifier. Now, uh, so the tank's not going to be impacted, but there's a chance we can get the orchard if we roll a KIA result, which we do not. So the orchard's fine, as is the tank. Again, we do not impact normal terrain. We can only cause fires if it was burnable, which roads are not. So then we go into this axe here. And the ground hex, we need to take a critical hit die roll, which is not. And again, a six is not good enough to get us flame. So we just do a normal minus three morale check for that four, six, seven, which he rolled an 11. So he's uh, broken. He needed a 10 or less. All right, and then this FFE1 would get replaced with its FFE2 counterpart. And all this beautiful, gorgeous plus two smoke would get laid down as well. All right, lastly, let's talk about um, observers, off board and aerial. So we'll assume that row N is going to be our board edge. So nothing to the left of that exists, just for uh, vision purposes. And we're going to assign an offboard observer hex N5. Now, it should be noted that the observer does not physically occupy N5. It's just used as a marker to measure your lines of sight from. The unit is actually offboard, and he's going to be immune to any onboard effects, with the sole exception of drifting smoke. Drifting smoke will obviously impact any accuracy. Drifting smoke can come offboard, but you cannot create smoke offboard. Nothing happens offboard from an onboard uh, unit. Also, your radio contact and maintenance are automatic, so all you have to do is a chick drop, and your accuracy is going to be reduced to one. Even if you're German, British, or American, your accuracy will be reduced to one. Again, unless you have pre-registered fire hacks, in which case it would be a four. But aside from that, it's treated exactly like an onboard observer. Again, you have a predefined, usually by SSR, or you can purchase the capability, but you are, you're assigned a hex somewhere on the board edge, and uh, that's just used for measuring your lines of sight. Aside from that, uh, everything is similar to an onboard observer for a procedure for calling in fire. When it comes to aerial observer, however, we have a couple more differences to add. First of all, as I said, in general, it's the same as an off-board observer, except you have you're in the air now I did make an air support tutorial video I recommend you watch that if you interested because I go into more detail about aerial observers well in essence all aircraft have a morale of eight 
and all aircraft have inherent radios. So you're always going to be using the aircraft's inherent radio, and you're never going to lose contact unless you get involved in a dogfight with enemy aircraft. <clears throat> and because your morale is an 8, all right, so we use uh, the sighting task check modifiers because you must make a successful sighting task check before any attempt at battery access. So while your radio contact and maintenance again are automatic, before you make your battery access chit draw attempt, you must make a successful sighting task check. To do that, again, the benefit of Aerial Observer is you can pick any hex on the board edge at any time at will to make your sights, uh, your, your sight checks from. So while aircraft have no, uh, generally speaking, blind hexes, certain situations could generate a blind hex. In addition, you also want to maybe pick the uh, best vantage point. So for example, should we have some smoke coming off, say a wrecked vehicle that's in this location? it might have a good chance of obscuring those units there. So you may want to pick a vantage point that gives you a better uh, sighting task check. The reason why is you do not want to roll a 12 or more. Now, again, before you can do any chit draw, you must make your, your um, sighting task check. So you must pick a target, which is going to be the focus of your fire. So if you want to pick the armored, which is probably the best bet, um, the modifiers quickly turn into our favor. If you look at the chart, you can see the target's vehicle is minus one. If this was, the, say, the German turn and the vehicle had just entered the orchard, it would be a further minus one because it entered a new hex. And because it's not entirely concealed or hip, there's another minus two. So that's a total of minus four to your die roll. So you're obviously going to be guaranteed a sighting task check. You contrast that with units that are in buildings. And if we make the... Uh, Say so this is your target here, and we make the uh, unit concealed. You can quickly see how it stacks against you. Plus three for being in a building. No modifiers for not being entirely concealed. And therefore, you have a plus three to your die roll. Should you roll a mistaken attack, all that's going to happen is your opponent's going to grab your handy-dandy little FFE1. And uh, he's going to drop it on the closest friendly unit in uh, proximity to your target hex that's also in line of sight of your uh, of the observation plane. Battery access is automatic and it drops an FFE1 directly on you. Now it must be corrected and uh, uh, so we do an accuracy die roll. We roll a 3 so it's not going to be accurate. Remember Americans need a 2. And then we roll for uh, random location die roll. So we go uh, two for six. So we saved our bacon. This FFE comes off here for six. However, in now the American uh, turn, you do not have a chance to cancel your mission. Your um, FFE one is going to be corrected. Actually, it would have been replaced with an FFE two. It will be corrected back onto you again. It must be rolled for accuracy, and then distance and location. So this time we went uh, one for two. So hopefully we have no enemy in this look or friendly in this location because they will be bombarded by your own artillery. That's why you want to pick a clear and obvious a target for your sighting task check. Again, if you start to if you, you have a brain fart, you pick the concealed unit in the building. You're going to be adding a plus three, or you could have had a nice juicy minus four because it's an AAV. Uh, Actually, target is an orchard, so it would have been a plus three. And um, vehicle entered a new location, and not entirely concealed would be a net minus one. So you'd have a net minus one if you're sitting in an orchard after having moved, which is still better than having a plus three. So the uh, a benefit, again, of Aerial Observer is you can pick any hex to make your shot from. You could do a spotting round from here, move to here to do an FFE if you want it for whatever reason. Um, you have the capability of moving at will at any time. The drawback is the mistaken attack should you roll a final 12 or more. And again, you can start increasing the uh, number of positive modifiers 
quite easily. I never even added in the plus one for the friendly unit, <clears throat> which would have made it uh, a net zero modifier. So again, there'd be a very real chance of you not even hitting the tank in the open with your artillery. But that's how aerial observers work. And there we have OBA 201, some advanced concepts on how to move spotting rounds, how to convert them, and more correct FFEs. And we went into some effects, and then we finally covered off offboard and aerial observers. So again, hopefully this video was some use to you in your OBA missions. Uh, hope you roll well, and uh, we'll see you guys in part three. We're going to start talking about the seven different fire missions, finishing it up with a bombardment. See you guys next video.